So I want to describe to you how I think about this problem as an algebraic geometer. So curves are what I eat for breakfast. And um, You so told me you had crepes for breakfast. <laughs> Just to test how loud your voice is going to sound on the camera, what you ate for breakfast this morning? Um, a crepe. A crepe. What did you have on it? Something yummy? Fruit? I had two. I had one that had five cheese and the other one had lemon and sugar. Today. Okay. Normally it's curves. Okay. <laughs> I took a day off. Okay, so first I have to tell you how I think about a curve. So there was this invariant, the graph of a degree d polynomial. Remember there was that, what specified the type was the degree. And there is a notion of degree more generally, and it's how wobbly the curve is. Oh, first of all, I want to say my curve is going to be in an arbitrary dimensional space. So let's say I'm in an, in an r dimensional space. So r is a variable here. So it's like if we were in our real three-dimensional world, r would be three. On the xy plane, r was two. But I want to allow r to be something more general. And now I have a curve in this space. It's some amount twisty. Who knows how twisty it is? That's one measure of how complicated it is. And I can attach an invariant to measure how twisty it is, which is called the degree. So I take a random horizon in this space. So this is something of dimension r minus 1. So it's just some, some horizon. And every time the curve twists around, it meets the horizon in a new point. So a measure of the twistiness is the number of points. So the number of times it meets that horizon, this number is called the degree d of the curve. So that's another invariant. And then there's one more secret hidden invariant that you can't see from these pictures. And that's that really we should be working over the complex numbers. If you think about from the fundamental theorem of algebra, um, these curves, they, they come from solutions of polynomial equations. So really, we should be thinking over the complex numbers. And if I think about what this curve is over the complex numbers, it actually looks like a surface, because the complex numbers are sort of have two real dimensions. So there's several possibilities for what this curve looks like. It could look like the surface of a sphere, or it could look like the surface of a one-hole donut, or it could look like the surface of a two-hole donut. I think you get the picture. Any number of holes, and this number of holes is another invariant that we call the genus of the curve. And I'll use the letter g. So the type of curve I want to consider, it lives in an r-dimensional space. It has degree d, and it has genus g. So the question is, what's the maximum number of general points that it interpolates? If you do some dimension counting, which is, uh, which is sort of the first naive thing, you would get the following guess. The maximum number of random points it interpolates is, OK, the following number, which I promise is here for a good reason. So r plus 1 times d minus r minus 3 times g minus 1 all over r minus 1. This floor is the guess for the maximum number of points. So here's a theorem that I proved with my collaborator, Eric Larson, from last year. A curve of degree d and genus g in r dimensions. Let me put one little star here, because I actually have to restrict the type of curve uh, that I'm considering. Um, so you probably want to edit this out of the video. <laughs> but this is, <laughs> I need to actually restrict to brill their curves. So these are curves that are, in some sense, there's nothing special about them as an abstract curve. Little caveat. Uh, but it's, it's the natural class of curves that you would consider as an algebraic geometer. So curve of degree d and genus g in r dimensions interpolates this expected number, r plus 1 d minus r minus 3 g minus 1 over r minus 1, random points, if and only if, if and only if dgr is not 1 of 5, 2, 3, 6, 4, 3, 7, 2, 5, and 10, 6, 5. So the guess is usually right. Isn't that crazy? The guess is right with exactly four counterexamples. And no, no others. I could put a billion other numbers in you there. You could put a bunch of other numbers with this small caveat. I can, I can tell you what, what this caveat requires. You require that g minus r plus 1 times g minus d plus r has to be greater than or equal to 0. But still, that's tons and tons and tons of numbers. And every single time you do that, you will be able to interpolate this expected number of points 
unless you are one of these four counterexamples. The four counterexamples? Yeah. I'm not asking you to explain it, yeah. but is it explained or is it just a weird quirk? No, it's explained. Right. It's explained. So each time you have one of these counterexamples, it's a curve that lives on a certain type of surface and that surface doesn't pass through the right number of points, so the curve can't hope to possibly pass through the right number of points. It must be nice, right, to prove a theorem and write a paper, and you know, that must be a really great moment for you as a yeah. mathematician. But do you wish it wasn't kind of a little bit ugly with all these caveats? Like, does this count as a beautiful proof, or is this like one that you're like, oh man. Oh, I've... the proof is really tricky, but I think the theorem is very beautiful. I would say, I didn't mean to sell this as a caveat, it's just, I didn't want to give you the definition of this class of curves, but it's the natural class of curves you would consider. Um, but we have completely solved this problem. So, I mean, I started working on this in 2016. It was the first paper I wrote in grad school was the case R equals three. And then I wrote another paper in 2017 with the case R equals four. And then, um, and then I started working on the general case. So, I mean, and I'm ignoring everybody else's previous uh, partial results on this problem, of which there were many. Um, but yeah, I think this is a very beautiful result because it completely answers the question. Does the theorem have a name yet? I call it the interpolation theorem okay. for Brill and other curves. Okay, yeah. cool. All right. It's not going to get named after you and Larson. <laughs> I don't know. I, I hope so. <laughs> That'd be awesome. Yeah. We'll see what happens. History yeah. will decide. Yeah. <laughs>